Douglas London worked for the CIA for more than 30 years. He was the agency's chief of station and counterterrorism chief for South and Southwest Asia. Douglas, welcome to the program. I, 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 we will talk about the future implications in a moment, but I just wanted to ask you about what happened at the airport on Thursday. Do you believe it was wrong for the US military to be coordinating with the Taliban? Did the Americans really think that the Taliban could provide security? Well, Don, thank you for having me on the program. I don't really think the United States had much alternative. As, as you and your audience are aware, usually Western facilities, European facilities, Turkish facilities in Afghanistan would have outer rings of security, usually local forces, police, security, army. That left with the withdrawal and the collapse of the Afghan government. With um, NATO troops on the ground there at the airport, they really had no choice but to depend on the Taliban. And the Taliban, despite perhaps an effort to establish some of those rings of security, you're not talking about a sophisticated, well-trained group. And I myself have gotten through enough checkpoints with, you know, a bit of a, of a, of a gift that it's quite possible that either they just weren't effective enough or the ISIS-K, the Daesh fighters were able to get through by sort of paying their way through. Okay, so if we look back at the original aims of George W. Bush's uh, invasion, in terms of counterterrorism and intelligence operations, how useful was the work that was being done in Afghanistan in terms of keeping the West safe? The 20 years of sustained pressure on terrorist organizations operating from Afghanistan uh, was effective and can be measured by the metrics of how many attacks and what their scale was since the time of 9-11. Uh, Al-Qaeda, a uh, number of the other groups, Al-Qaeda's partner organizations and affiliates, went through uh, a sustained amount of attrition that kept them on the defensive, that impeded their ability to plot, train, plan, communicate, and finance operations. So uh, clearly, the mission in Afghanistan for NATO and the United States uh, morphed over the years, and, and I've been vocal about my points that that might not have been in the best interest of our country, nor of the Afghan people. But that what it was set out to do in the sense of counterterrorism was largely effective. And so do you therefore expect now the withdrawal of foreign troops to have a significantly negative impact in terms of keeping the rest of the world safe? I mean, we know that Afghanistan is still extremely unstable, but in terms of exporting terror from there. You know, the American Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was asked about that and asked about the, the potential for terrorist groups such as al-Qaeda to reconstitute. And he referred to an, an assessment that suggested anywhere from one to two years with the American withdrawal. But that assessment, which he didn't add, was based on the, the presence of an Afghan partner, that the Afghan government would still be at war with the Taliban, but would provide us in a means to partner with them to collect intelligence, to preempt terrorist operations. With the Taliban now controlling the country and based on their historic relationships with groups such as al-Qaeda, and, and I know your audience is, is, is knowledgeable that that history is one of integration of the two groups. It's not just collaboration and partnership. They've really molded into one another. You're not going to see the Taliban cut their ties, and they certainly don't see that as their obligation from the February 2020 treaty, which they believe they're held to preventing terrorist operations from being mounted, not from expelling these groups. And as we've seen from recent statements of Taliban officials suggesting that 9-11 was not even uh, the work of al-Qaeda, it'd be rather hard to have confidence that the Taliban would be a serious partner. So the United States will maintain collection capabilities offshore, remotely. It will be more challenging, but they'll still provide some insight into developments. And then it'll be a uh, challenge in terms of how then to act on what information we may develop. Douglas, U.S. intelligence says there are a few hundred uh, members of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Joe Biden says that's not true, and the, the Taliban says that's not true either. But let's go with the U.S. intelligence reports. Why didn't the U.S. military attack those al-Qaeda members over the past few years? Well, I think metrics like that are always problematic, and they also don't really reflect the capability of a group. For uh, most of the world, the threat that al-Qaeda presents is that of asymmetrical warfare, terrorist operations, which you don't really need a great number of fighters. Fighters are for combat on the ground, if you would. And al-Qaeda has done that as well, particularly for Afghanistan, particularly as an augmentation of special forces in providing training and shock troops, if you would. 
So uh, to look at the numbers, it depends on how you interpret them. A lot of those numbers from the reports you're quoting include the local affiliate, which is the Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. And that's a group that did have members that came from Al-Qaeda core, such as uh, a recent emir who was killed uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago, Asim Umar, who actually came originally from India, was a member of the Indian Mujahideen. But I don't think it's necessarily an accurate reflection, and it doesn't suggest that they're readily present on the, on the, on the battlefield. A lot of those people are family members, uh, those who are providing aid, facilitation, and such like that. And I think, for the most part, the United States did uh, conduct a, an exhaustive attrition of al-Qaeda's leadership and even its mid-core operators, such that a number of them were released from Bagram prison when the Taliban took over, a number of both al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. And there's a great many uh, al-Qaeda families and operatives in Iran who have been living there under the protection of the Iranian government, many of whom I suspect will start migrating and making their way back to Afghanistan, having stayed in Iran for precisely what you're saying, to avoid that counterterrorism pressure. Douglas, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much indeed. Extremely instructive to hear from you. Douglas London speaking to us from Washington.